Let me try and square your deep dislike, hatred even, of religion with your core belief in Darwinian evolution. Because as I understand your, your world view, uh, you believe in, in evolution driven by a selfish gene. And that in the end, this sort of selfish gene does not produce things by accident. You know, there is a grand design to the universe that we see around us. Now, and that applies to human actions, it applies to ideas, as I understand it, as well as to the physical world. And if all of that is true, then how come so many billions of people on this planet do find meaning in religion if it is of no evolutionary purpose? I don't think I ever said that religion was of no evolutionary purpose. I mean, and that's certainly not. Uh, I think that religion being more or less a human universal in the sense that all human cultures have had it, not, not every individual, but all cultures have had it, I think it's any Darwinian has got to say that it is in some sense a product of our brains which are produced by Darwinian natural selection. Our brains are in some sense predisposed to be religious. I'm sure that's true. Uh, but, but, of course, but, that doesn't make it true. I mean, and if that, if, if that is true, that our brains are predisposed, predisposed to be religious, surely there's utility in it. Well, uh, even if there were utility in it, that still doesn't make it true. I mean, you could st it could w well be that having a false belief has utility. If, for example, a false belief makes you uh, comforted and consoled and less likely to suffer stress-related diseases like duodenal ulcers, then... Uh, false belief could then have Darwinian survival value. As a matter of fact, I don't think that's true, but uh, it, it, it doesn't, all I'm saying there with the Duolingo Lazar example is that it doesn't follow that because something has Darwinian utility, that therefore it's true. A false belief can have utility. In the end, aren't we all struggling to define meaning yes. in life and in the universe as we know it? And in the end, haven't all the great scientists had to accept that science doesn't provide the ultimate answers? And if science doesn't, then people, of course, look for other... Well, there, there are two things to say about that. First, science hasn't yet provided the ultimate answers, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't go on working. I mean, science has had a pretty good track record of getting closer and closer to ultimate answers. Uh, just let me stop you there, because it's yeah. fascinating. That, that's where you have a belief. You have faith. Your faith is in science. Your faith is in the idea that science will ultimately provide the answer no, to I, everything. No, I was about to say that, I, that it's, it's quite likely that science, that there are some questions that science will never be able to answer. For example, science may never be able to answer um, where did the laws of physics come from in the first place, something of that sort. Now, the second thing I was going to go on to say is that if science can't answer such a question, people may then seek answers elsewhere. But it would be wholly illogical to say that because science can't answer the question, therefore religion can, any more than witches and wizards and warlocks. Well, I understand that point, but wouldn't it be equally wrong and perhaps very arrogant to say that religion is definitely the wrong answer? No, it wouldn't. I mean, I, w I wouldn't say that, but I would put it on a par well, with... Well, you pretty much have with said an, that. Okay, a million other, I was about to say, put it on a par with a million other belief systems. The belief system of the Azandi, the belief system of the Navajo, the belief system of every Aboriginal tribe. These are all different. There's no particular reason to privilege the Judeo-Christian Muslim uh, kind of religion over any of, th of those. So they're all on a par. And none of those has ever had any success in the past See, in uncovering truths about the universe. Science has. I mean, has it, over the years, given you pause that Einstein, for example, did in the end talk about God? Einstein. Even Stephen Hawking, more I... recently, when he was striving to explain yeah, yeah, yeah. the look, universal they answer the referred word to God. God. They use the word God, but it's perfectly clear that neither Einstein nor Stephen... Well, Hawking is still alive, so you can ask him. But um, Einstein, you, you can't ask. But if you actually read Einstein, it's perfectly clear that he was using God as a kind of metaphor for that which we don't understand. So when Einstein said God does not play dice, that was his way of saying that he disagreed with Heisenberg's indeterminacy principle. When God said, sorry, when Einstein said, uh, did God have a choice in how the universe should be? What he meant was, is there only one kind of universe or could you imagine a different kind of universe? It was Einstein's poetic way of doing it. As so Hawking, it nothing more than poetry? Nothing. So more. I just want to end by yeah. asking you this. If you lost your faith in the universality of science and what science can achieve, is it ever possible that you might turn to God? 
Well, when you say lost faith in the universality of science, I mean, science is changing all the time. I mean, I would, if, if, if science as we now know it falls short in helping us to understand, then science needs to be changed. And doubtless it will be changed. It's been changed often enough in the past. But could it ever change in a direction toward the supernatural? I don't think it can, I mean, that, that's not a helpful way to put it. It would change in the direction of something which is so different from the, the natural that we at present understand that, that a naive person might call it supernatural, but it wouldn't be Zeus or Jove or, or, or Wotan or Yahweh. <laughs> Professor Dawkins, we have to leave it there, but thank you very much for being on Hard Talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.